Welcome to Current Events. This fourth program of the Current Events series deals with replacement motors and replacement motor guides with your host, the GE Answer Man. Yo, Georgie, here's some more motors. Bunch of big ones this time. Great, we can price them by the pound. Yeah! I need it. Yo! Georgie! Georgie! There you go. But I don't... Oh, need... don't worry. It's only an eight-pounder. It won't set you back too much. This isn't exactly the best example of the way to sell motors. And I'm quite sure that all of you take a lot more pride in your work than those fellows we've just seen. You want to be sure to provide the most suitable replacement motor possible, chosen by electrical and mechanical specifications, and not by the pound. In this fourth segment of our current event series, we'll be taking a good look at the replacement motors that are available, and how to utilize the replacement guides. But first, we'll briefly review some of the information we've discussed in past programs. We've examined these four common types of fractional horsepower AC motors. Shaded pole, permanent split capacitor, split phase, and capacitor start. These motors are given their names based on the method each one uses to develop starting torque. And each of these motors has its own unique characteristics, making it suitable for particular applications. The shaded pole motor has low starting torque, low efficiency, low cost, and a low range of horsepower. It is most often found in small vent fan applications and with the small fans found in refrigerators, room air conditioners, and furnaces. The permanent split capacitor motor has medium low starting torque and the highest efficiency of the four types. The PSC also has medium low cost and horsepower range. Typical PSC applications include direct drive fans and blowers in furnaces, heat pumps, room air conditioners, and central air conditioners. Next is a split phase motor. Here we have medium high torque, efficiency, cost, and horsepower. Split phase motors are commonly used with belted fans in furnaces and with pumps in both hot water circulators and oil burners. The fourth motor is the capacitor start. These have high torque and medium high efficiency. They also have the highest cost and the highest horsepower range. Capacitor start motors are found in hard to start applications, such as large air conditioning units, pumps, and commercial washers and dryers. In our last program, we introduced the various mechanical features of FHP motors. These included enclosures, bearings, and motor mountings. You remember that there are four types of motor enclosures. The first is the open enclosure. Here we have a number of ventilating openings which allow external air to enter and cool the motor windings. A variation of the open enclosure is the open drip proof enclosure. On this one, the ventilating openings are found only in the bottom half of the motor. This allows air to enter, but not drops of moisture. The third type of motor enclosure is known as partially enclosed. This enclosure is used where portions of the motor enclosure may be exposed to outside elements. In this example, one end shield and the motor shell are closed, providing the needed protection. However, the other end shield does have ventilating openings to allow external cooling air to reach the motor windings. The last common type of enclosure found on FHP motors is called totally enclosed, non-ventilated. This enclosure protects the motor entirely from outside elements. Note that the totally enclosed motors are normally larger than the same horsepower motors with open designs. 
the larger and more expensive design is needed to dissipate the heat since it is non-ventilated and outside air does not reach the windings to cool them. To sum up, there are four common types of enclosures found on fractional horsepower motors. Open, open drip proof, partially enclosed, and totally enclosed. Now, let's review motor bearings. Remember, bearings are used to support the shaft of the motor and allow it to turn freely, while at the same time, the shaft itself is supporting the weight of the rotor and the driven device. There are two principal types of bearings, ball and sleeve. Ball bearings consist of hardened steel balls retained by races, and they can handle heavy duty loads. Sleeve bearings, which are far more common, are both quieter and less expensive than ball bearings. This is an example of a standard sleeve bearing. The oil in the bearing forms a hydrodynamic film which eliminates metal to metal contact and greatly reduces friction. The last mechanical feature we'll review are motor mountings. There are eight common types of mountings. The first mounting is a formed steel plate with mounting holes welded to the shell. This is known as a rigid base. Next is the resilient cradle mount with rubber rings that isolate the motor vibrations. The third mount is called the flange mount. The shaft end end shield has mounting holes allowing the motor to be bolted directly to the unit. The extended through bolt mount is used in much the same fashion as the flange mount, but it is mounted using the same bolts that hold the end shields to the motor. The lug mount has three steel brackets that are welded to the motor shell, and these brackets in turn have holes for bolting them to the unit. The sixth mount, known as a belly band mount, is just what the name implies. A plain round frame motor is held by a band around its metal, and the legs of the band are bolted to the structure. Next is the adjustable steel bracket mount, which can be adjusted to accommodate different motor lengths. And finally, there is the torsion flex mount, which consists of three specially designed welted steel arms. The spatial steel and the shape of the arms provide superior vibration and noise isolation. The torsion flex mount also provides for a quick and simple installation. The eight types are again, rigid base, resilient cradle mount, flange mount, extended through bolt, lug mount, belly band, adjustable steel bracket, and torsion flex. Well, that's it for our review. If you're not comfortable with any of the information we've just discussed, we suggest watching current events number two and number three once again before continuing with this program. I got this split phase motor here that's just shot. I need a replacement, the right replacement. Do you know how to find the right replacement motor? That's what this current events program is all about how to make sure your customers are getting what they need. There are basically two types of replacement motors available that you can provide for your customers. The first is an exact replacement, or one with an identical model or part number assigned by the original equipment manufacturer. This is your first choice if an exact replacement is readily available. But in order to use an exact replacement in every instance, you'd have to maintain a very large inventory of all of the various OEM motors, and in some cases, pay fairly high prices due to the relatively small volume of a particular motor. The second type of replacement motor available is what we'll call a versatile motor. With these versatile motors, you have a suitable replacement for nearly every popular FHP motor in the field. Let's take a look at how these motors came into being. At first, exact replacement motors were the only ones available. However, it was noticed that most split-phase motors used in oil burners and belt-driven furnaces were extremely similar to one another. So it was a natural step for motor manufacturers to create a few motors 
that would fit many different oil burners and belt drives and to make them available to motor distributors. These versatile motors met with instant success and one by one this concept of replacement motors was extended to various other applications including domestic and commercial refrigeration and room and central air conditioning. One key ingredient for this success of versatile replacement motors is the use of various adapters and accessories. By employing these and other modifications, a single motor can be made suitable for many replacement situations. For example, a shaft on a versatile motor might be designed to be long enough for a number of different applications. In those instances where space requires a shorter shaft, it can simply be sawed off. Numerous mounting adapters are also available to make a replacement motor suitable for a given application. These include lug ring kits, resilient rings, resilient ring length adapters, torsion flex mounting kits, and bases of various sizes which can be added to a basic round frame motor. There is also a selection of water slingers, junction boxes, BX connectors, and the like. Capacitor kits are available to replace the original capacitor or to be used when the replacement motor requires a capacitor of a different rating. Many motors are designed to rotate in either direction. This rotational direction is determined by the proper connection of the external leads. The point to all of these modifications and adapters is simplification. One versatile replacement motor can be stocked instead of, say, 100 different motors for 10 different OEM's applications. That makes life much easier for those of you behind the counter. But aren't each of those 100 OEM motors a little different? Don't they vary in torque, speed, amps, or efficiency? It seems to me that the replacement motors don't give you an exact duplication. Those are good questions. It's true. The replacement motors can't always be exact duplicates of the original motors, and still offer the simplification of replacing a large number of OEM motors with a single replacement motor. But replacement motors don't need to be exact duplicates. We've already seen how mechanical features can be changed with mounting adapters and the like. The electrical differences we were just asked about are indeed taken into consideration. The theory of replacement motor design employs what's known as a bell curve. Let's take, for example, one-third horsepower, six-pole, 230-volt direct drive motors. We may have several hundred different OEM models of that rating to consider. If we plot the torque of all of those models based on a scale of low to high, we will find a few with very low torque and a few with very high torque. The majority will fall somewhere in between. As you can see, this will form a bell-shaped curve. A replacement motor designed with a torque value slightly higher than the peak of the bell curve will successfully serve as a replacement for the majority of these OEM motors. Those motors that fall on the ends of the curve may be pushed off to another bell curve where a replacement motor will be designed to meet their needs or they may require an exact replacement. Similar curves are plotted for watts, efficiency, etc., and taken into consideration for the final versatile replacement motor design. So any motor's listed replacement will indeed be a good replacement. Any differences you notice are acceptable. For an example, you might see that the amp rating of the replacement is less than the amps of the original. This is often due to the fact that the replacement is one of the extra high efficiency motors available today. These energy saver motors, like all high efficiency motors, use less amps to provide the same horsepower as standard motors. Sometimes you might find a one-third horsepower motor listed as a replacement for a one-half horsepower motor. You can bet that the original one-half horsepower motor was a rather weak one and that the substitution is appropriate. Well, now we know the why and how of the development of versatile replacement motors. The next problem to solve is how in the world do you find out which of the many replacement motors available is the right choice 
for any one of the thousands of original motors used by hundreds of OEMs. Well, it's really not as difficult as it might sound. So let's go over to our customer counter and find out how to go about this seemingly difficult task. The easiest way to find the right replacement motor is to look in one of the replacement guides. Simply note the original motor model number on the nameplate, and these guides will cross-reference that number to the stock number of the proper replacement motor. The guides are published by motor manufacturers, such as GE, and most major distributors also publish their own guides. These give a mixture of both original equipment manufacturer and motor manufacturer's numbers. We'll use one of the GE guides as a typical example. So why don't you take a look with me? This is where we really get down to business. The number of the original motor should be found in this alphanumeric listing. OK, we know we need a KCP 39, and we're looking for a KGH 005. Here it is. Next is the stock number of the replacement model, followed by a footnote codes for the proper modification. All right, now we know that we're looking for replacement stock number 3046 and that it will require a modification P. Turn to the next section and we find modification P shows that the original motor has resilient rings and that we'll need accessory length adapter kit 161L131 AB1. This kit will provide additional length to the motor so it can fit in the original base and still be mounted with resilient rings. We all know that anyone can make a mistake, so it's always wise to double check the specifications of the original model against those listed for the replacement stock number that we now have. The specs for the replacement model are also available in most replacement guides, and in our example here, they're listed by motor diameter. Most FHP motors come in four nominal diameters, three and a half, four, five, and five and a half inches. If you're not familiar enough with FHP motors to tell by looking, then go ahead and measure it. If it's three and three eighths, call it three and a half. The diameters might not always be exact. All right, this motor's five and a half inches. So that's the section we'll turn to. If we happen to know the application is an outdoor condenser fan, we can save a little time. Since this guide has subsections according to motor type and applications. Our replacement stock number was 3046. And here it is. This listing verifies that the replacement motor has all of the proper specs for horsepower, voltage, RPM, rotation, amperage, and capacitor rating as compared to the nameplate data on the failed original motor. In addition, there are some columns listing motor length and overall length. In this case, the replacement motor is shorter, but we know that we'll be modifying it with the accessory length adapter kit so that it will fit the original base. Well, now that we're armed with our stock number and we're satisfied with its specifications, we can get the appropriate replacement model from the shelf. Hi there, may I help you? Yeah, I got a blown motor here from an outdoor condenser. Mm -hmm. I need a replacement motor. All right, let's take a look at it for you. It's five and a half inches in diameter. Model number is KCP39 PGB593. Let's look it up in the catalog. KCP39 PGB593. Here it is. See that stock number 3030, and the footnote codes are A. And D. Okay. We'll need a lug mounting kit, and we'll have to change the capacitor to one with a seven and a half microfarad rating. Let me double check, check the specs on that for you. Thirty thirty. Let's see. We've got a half horsepower. Right. Uh, and two thirty volts. Uh huh. Ten seventy five RPM. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, the rotation is reversible, so no problem there, and the amp rating is 4.1. Uh-oh, the original draw is 4.4. Uh, don't worry, this is a high efficiency motor. And so you still get the same half horsepower rating, you just won't be drawing as much current. Sounds good to me. Okay. 
Uh, this comes with a 10 microfarad capacitor, but we're changing it to 7.5. Now let's check the dimensions. Uh, we've got an overall length of 12.38, and the motor itself is 6 and 3 eighths. Okay, it looks like the replacement motor is going to have a longer overall shaft than this one, but it shouldn't cause you any problem in a remote condenser application. So hang on, I'll get one for you. Okay. There you are. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, hold on. Let me just make one last check. Let's make sure that what's in the box is what's supposed to be in the box. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I think we're all right. Well, thanks again. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Okay, bye. That's what we all want to see, a satisfied customer. Oh, by the way, there will soon be one other way to find the right replacement motor that we haven't discussed yet. And that's by using what will be the ultimate in replacement guides, a computer. The data banks for a computerized cross-reference system will include major motor manufacturers' model numbers and OEM part numbers. Ideally, with this computer system, a terminal anywhere in the world can be linked to the database by a telephone. All you have to do is to punch up the original motor model number or OEM part number, and you'll receive the appropriate replacement stock numbers and modification codes. These certainly speed things up for those of us behind the counter. And I'd imagine you could expect to see them in a lot of shops in the not-too-distant future. All right, so now we've seen three different sources of information for replacement motors. The replacement guides with the cross-reference stock numbers, the motor descriptions with specifications, and the computer database. But what happens if the motor you need isn't listed in any of these sources? Chances are that you may still find a good replacement in your own stock. The trick is to know what's on your shelves. It helps to categorize your stock by application. Know which replacement motors are used with furnaces or which are used with central air conditioners, etc. This knowledge comes with experience, but a little extra study will always help. Knowing your stock by application will give you a good start on finding a suitable replacement for an unlisted motor. The next step is to go down a checklist of mechanical and electrical specs to find a suitable match for your failed motor. Use the motor description section of your guide and start with the diameter. Check for horsepower, voltage, frequency, rotation, amperage, and RPM. Also check the number of speeds. You'll want to match the enclosure and the mounting. Remember, there are a lot of mounting adapters available that can give you the mounting you need. Check for bearing type. Remember, a ball bearing can be substituted for a sleeve bearing, but you can't do the opposite. Sleeve bearings won't hold up under the loads found in ball bearing applications. And of course, you need to look at the potential replacement's dimensions. If it's too small, it might be adapted to fit the application. But if it's too large, well, then you better look for another. To review what we've just discussed, remember, go down the checklist, diameter, mounting, electrical specifications, bearings, motor dimensions, and shaft dimensions. The chances are good that you will find a good replacement. Even if you can't find an exact duplicate of your original motor, many customers will be more than satisfied with a legitimate substitution. For example, let's say you need to replace a one-third horsepower single-speed motor, but you don't have one in stock. Take a look at your multiple-speed motors. A one-third horsepower three-speed motor typically has one-sixth horsepower at low speed, one-quarter horsepower at medium, and one-third horsepower at high, just what you're looking for. By taping the leads for the lower two speeds, you now have the one-third horsepower single-speed motor that you need. A one-half horsepower three-speed motor will work as well. These motors typically have one-third horsepower at medium speed. So in this case, you'd cut out the low and high speeds for your one-third horsepower single-speed application. You can also make a substitution in enclosures in some cases. For example, you can consider replacing an open enclosure with a totally enclosed model, but make sure that the totally enclosed model will still fit into the unit, since it will probably be larger than the open motor. 
This is due to the extra material used to dissipate the heat in the totally enclosed motor. Once again, the key is to know the products on your shelves. In this case, a little knowledge isn't dangerous, it really helps. And a lot of knowledge helps even more. We're all in the business of selling motors, and those of us who do it well will outsell those of us who don't. Hello again. Hi. <laughs> Looks like I got a real tough one for you this time. This has got to be the oldest motor I've ever seen, and the nameplate is long gone. Got any ideas? I think maybe we can fix you up okay. Do you have any ideas on what to do with this unknown soldier? That's the subject of our next program. And until then, thanks for joining us as we both stay current in our work. Replacement Motors and Replacement Motor Guides has been a presentation of the General Electric Company.